Good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to series weekly winter webinar series. Thank you all for coming and being part of our discussion today. Our topic for this session is climate change and natural systems. My name is Jane Burns. I'm the manager of series outreach education. This education team works with over 300 schools and early learning centres in Metro Melbourne to embed sustainability into, every, into learning, teaching and systems change. Before we begin, I acknowledge that we're meeting virtually on the country of the First Nation people of Australia. With many of us being in Melbourne, on, we're on lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are in this session. I also acknowledge that we're in the middle of multiple and intersecting crises of health, economy, climate and ecology. As we find ourselves in these times of danger and fear, we also find ourselves in a time of great change, of resilience and care for each other. And at Ceres, we're committed to helping people fall in love with the earth, and developing the leadership and resilience that is needed now and into the coming decades. We do this by providing education programs for all ages and social enterprises that enable people to meet their social and material ways in a sustainable way. Today's webinar is brought to you by Sirius School of Nature and Climate, which encompasses all of our education programs. The webinar series has covered a number of our learning areas or the branches in our tree from permaculture, regenerative agriculture, new economies, and today we're talking about climate and natural systems. This is the last of a series of four, but please keep an eye out for more, for more webinars and conversations to come. So I'm thrilled to bring you today's session on climate and natural systems. The question that frames the topic is, what have we learned about our resilience and behaviours during COVID-19? And how are we better placed to act on climate change? I'll expand on this question when I introduce the speakers, Rebecca Huntley and Dr. Susie Burke. And as we go, if you have questions for our speakers, please submit these on our Q&A function on the webinar. We'll come back to these in the second half of our session. We'll also post any references or links mentioned by the speakers, we we'll post it in our chat. Now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Susie Burke. Dr. Susie Burke is an environmental psychologist, therapist, climate activist, and parent. With many years of experience working on climate change and disasters, for 17 years, she was a senior psychologist at the Australian Psychological Society and developed numerous resources, training programs, and workshops on these topics, including the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook and the Psychological First Aid Handbook. Susie is a fellow of the Australian Psychological Society. She's raising bike riders, school strikers and fruit trees, and is very pleased that her council has just declared a climate emergency in the Shire. Welcome, Susie. Just waiting for Susie to come in. Hi, Susie. Hi there. Thank you very much, Jane, for that invitation and for getting me on to talk at this lunchtime. I'm thrilled to be here. Great, I'm just going to adjust my, um, my sound. Apologies for this. Let's take this off. Okay, so Susie, you're the lead author of the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook, which puts forward eight insights to activate the public into more effectively engaging with the challenge of climate change. It helps us to understand the social and psychological barriers to action on climate change, like the human tendency to see climate change distant in time and space and therefore not needing our own personal and urgent action. But also we are hardwired to avoid distress and feelings that come with thinking about worrying things like climate change, our health or safety of our children. I apologise everyone, I'm just going to reset my sound. I seem to have had a initiative in this and I'll just re, I'll reintroduce um, that question to Susie. My apologies. After all these months of our, of our tech um, trials, we're still, we're still working it out, aren't we? Let me just turn this up. Okay. Susie, you, can you hear me okay? I can hear you better now than the first time you said it. Okay, fabulous. Let's, let's reset that. So you're the lead author of the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook, which puts forward eight insights to activate the public into more effectively engaging with the challenge of climate change. It helps us to understand the social and psychological barriers to action on, on climate change, 
like the human tendency to see climate change as distant in time and space and therefore not needing our own personal and urgent attention. But also we are hardwired to avoid distressing feelings that come with thinking about worrying things like climate change, our health or the safety of our children. During COVID-19, have we experienced increased resilience and adaptation as we've had to come to terms with threats to our health and our species? And what behaviours can we continue to act to do to act on climate change? Well, that's a very lovely question. Thank you, Jane. What I thought I'd do in um, uh, five minutes is just talk a little bit about the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook and relate that to a more recent piece of research that's come out of climate outreach in the UK, which um, is a communications on climate change body that bases everything that they talk about in their research. And the whole point of when I wrote the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook was to bring together decades and decades of social science and psychology research on what do we know about how humans engage with environmental problems and what can we learn about that that can help us you know be effective in action so I thought it was worthwhile looking at the activate model and updating it with this more recent research that's come out about how to communicate about climate change um, in this time of COVID-19. Um, so the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook uh, works on these eight principles um, that are summarised by this acronym ACTIVATE, so A-C-T-I-V-A-T-E. And I'll start off with A, which is acknowledge feelings, because that is one of the big things that I think everybody's been having to deal with during this time of COVID. And it's also what I increasingly are hearing is reported in the media as being the second wave of the disaster of uh, COVID-19 will be the mental health impacts and we know that there are huge mental health impacts of people being quarantined and being in lockdown and losing their jobs but as a psychologist who works with people around climate change I'm also particularly interested in the huge impacts that it has on people in terms of how they think about the existential threat of climate change in the light of what we've seen the government can do when there's a global pandemic threatening us um, and the anxieties that many people have got about what is going to happen now and people's fears that what might happen now is that the economic um, stimulus and regrowth might happen in a fossil fuel driven way which has been our way in Australia and that would of course be catastrophic and so I happen to know from the work that I do with individuals and groups that this is very much front of, of mind and is an ongoing source of anxiety for people in this period. So one of the things um, that I have been talking about with people in groups and in, in various webinars during this period is this thing that we call an ambiguous loss and ambiguous losses are the sorts of losses that we've been feeling around and through this period of COVID. So an ambiguous loss is one where we're not actually really sure yet what we're grieving. We're not actually sure if the problem has um, has been, has that we know what the problem is yet and of course we don't because so much is yet to unfold and you know a week ago we were booking holidays and now we're being locked back down again and you know we thought our kids were going to go to school and now our kids are, some of our kids are back home again so it's this rolling series of uncertainty and ambiguity which is what makes the COVID situation an ambiguous loss so these are some of the feelings that we've been having to to deal with now when I was looking at this research just recently um this document communicating about climate change during COVID-19, one of the things that they were talking then about in terms of how do we talk about climate change when people are still feeling anxious and uncertain and dealing with all these ambiguous losses? And the answer is to do it with um, sensitivity and to be really sensitive to the timing as well. Because in times of intense stress, people are, uh, do need time to recover and they need time to be able to talk about the, their experience that they're having at the time. And we find this with research around um, talking about climate change in times of natural disasters as well. A lot of the UK research has been done in times of flood because that tends to be their enormous and expensive and devastating flood um, disaster. For us down in the south, it's often the bushfires. Um, and if people are struggling in their own personal lives, which many we know are around the, the lockdown and the economic consequences of COVID, let alone, you know, if you've been personally impacted by people getting sick and dying, people need, people may not have the capacity to be thinking about other problems. Um, and there's this theory called the, the finite pool of worry, which means that we can only worry about so many things at, the, at a time. And if people are very caught up in worrying about, uh, you know, how they're going to survive 
financially, then that can be really difficult. However, the other message that's happening at the moment is how fragile society is and how um, much we benefit when we all cooperate and collaborate. And that's been a huge success story in the countries where we have been able to deal really effectively and swiftly with COVID to reduce the health impact of the, um, of the virus itself is through um, people cooperating and and collaborating and so there are also these opportunities to be able to talk about um, these strengths and skills in community as being as being a real strength and so the second thing or the uh, that this document talked about was looking at the research about altruistic um, community values and how a crisis brings these to a fore and we act to the fore and we've absolutely seen this and what we know too is that these altruistic values that have been in place Play a lot with how people have been responding to COVID and that's you know an example of that would be the, the big rise of mutual aid groups and a lot of those new neighborhood community efforts to you know make sure that you know, people in the neighborhood are, are all being looked after and feeling as if they've got some companionship and some love and some help and support whilst they've been locked down and isolated. Um, what we also know is that those altruistic values are linked to higher um, environmental sustainability behaviours. So that's, of course, a, um, you know, a, a pairing of these things in a, in a remarkably um, effective way. However, what we also know is that during a time of crisis, fault lines in a society will be accentuated. And we've been seeing that um, in America with the riots and the rise of you know, racist and um, and other sort of negative and, and hostile outgrouping and, and things like that. So again, there's, there's both of these possibilities that happen, both the rise of altruistic values, but also the, the rise of racism and um, intolerance and, and division. And so messaging around the research that they've shown is that, again, as always with climate change, messaging around these themes of collaboration and mutual support and aid and compassion for other people is a really successful type of um, messaging. And the other thing, Jane, that you were asking that question was, well, how can we continue to act? One of the things that everybody has, um, you know, been talking about with their friends, and I, I find that all of my clients are talking about this, is um, looking at what are the things that they want to keep that they have changed, that they were forced to change because of the shutdown that they want to continue to keep. And in fact, there was a story in the ABC just this morning about young office workers saying, I don't really want to go back to the office. Um, certainly not wanting to go back to the office five days a week, you know, when working the long hours that they were working. And a study that was done in the UK right at the very beginning of, of COVID was saying that 85% of people were saying that they actually wanted to keep um, and continue the personal and social changes that they had embarked on. So how do we do that? What does the research say about how we do that? What it's, um, so one of the, and this is one of the really important things is how do we retain these changes? Because moments of shift, so it's very hard to change people's behavior and get them to adopt different ways of doing things. And in fact, habit and old ways of doing things is one of the biggest barriers, psychological barriers that we find in people adopting pro-environmental behaviors. But moments of shift, like what happened when all of a sudden, incredibly swiftly, we were shut down and we changed and broke absolutely everything that we were doing, is when habits are disrupted. And uh, we were forced into it. And it's, moment, and it's moments like that when people are much more open to changing their behaviour. So how do we keep that going? What the research shows is that using social norms, so this was the C in the activate model, create social norms. And don't worry, Jane, I'm not going to go through all eight of them. I'm not going to have time. But um, yeah, so modelling and talking about new social norms. So that's to do with the conversations that we have about people where we, you know, we chatting and if we get to go to a dinner party um, or we're you know chatting to people when we're picking up kids from school or whatever to be talking out loud about the things that you're wanting to do that you want to retain and change and of course for those of us that are wanting to embed um, climate change in all of our conversations that it's a great opportunity as well to use the, the T in activate which is talk about it talk about climate change um, you know at every opportunity that you've got can be a way of joining together the talking creating social norms about the things that you personally are planning to retain and keep in your you know in your new in the new normal that you're going to be creating um, 
so, and the last thing that I might just say before I finish and, and let us hear from Rebecca is um, a really important message that comes out always in the research that um, Climate Outreach does on the language that we should use. Um, and it's very pertinent to, to climate change. And it's the word, it's, it's the use of the word just or fair. And they always are recommending and advising that, that we use when we're communicating about the solutions that we want governments to um, take on into going into the future, that we use the word fair when we talk about them, because it's much more appealing to people across the political divide. People on the left are very comfortable with the word justice. People on the right see that as being a leftist value and they stop listening when we talk about that. And there will be a lot of talk about having, you know, a, um, you know, a just, <laughs> a just way of, um, you know, greening up this new economy. It's really important that we remember to try to use the word fair. And I just wanted to finish with a very last point. I was reading an, um, a report by the Climate Council, which was on, you know, what are the major principles that we need to base the, the, the rebuild in the economy on. And of course, it's getting off fossil fuels right now and no gas because that's not a solution at all. But one of the points that they made was that there's going to be at all levels of government an enormous amount of economic stimulation. And these are going to bring, incur great debts that future generations are going to incur. And whilst it was, um, more the case that older people in our community were vulnerable to uh, getting sick and dying from COVID-19. Um, it required young people's and continue, will continue to require young people's enormous cooperation. But the young people, and I've got three of them who are on the edge of leaving school and going off into the world, are the ones who are, um, are going to be most vulnerable to um, low job prospects and more expensive cost of higher education and all of those things. And it would totally suck if uh, young people whose cooperation was absolutely essential in order to protect the wider community, if they um, end up suffering not just from the blow of enormous economic impacts now and for their immediate future, but also to have to take the debt of um, a fossil fuel rebuild. So it's absolutely unquestionably the case that the economic stimulation rebuild has to be one that creates this fair society for, for all members of the society. But I was particularly struck by the impact of the younger people who will be paying the debts of the bad choices, if we make bad choices now for their entire lifetime. Let's not do that. Susie, thank you so much for those insights. Um, we've got a lot of work um, to do and the work is certainly cut out for us as, um, as a human race. Um, and I'm um, so pleased to be sharing the session with, with you as a psychologist and those insights you provided um, from tolerance to fault lines, to care and compassion, to just the real importance of this window of opportunity that we have in this disruption. So um, look forward to uh, speaking with you again in the question time in the second half. So thank you. Thank you. Now I'll introduce our second speaker, uh, Rebecca Huntley. Rebecca Huntley is one of Australia's foremost, sorry, Dr. Rebecca Huntley is one of Australia's foremost researchers on social trends. For nearly nine years, Rebecca was at the Global Research from Ipsos. From 2006 to 2015, she was the director of the Mind and Mood Report, Australia's longest running social trends report. She is the author of numerous books and was a feature writer for Australian Vogue, a col columnist for BRW, and the presenter of Drive on Friday um, on Radio National. She is on the Artistic Advisory Board of the Bell Shakespeare Company, a board member of the Whitlam Institute, and an adjunct senior lecturer at the School of Social Sciences, Sciences at the University of New South Wales. So welcome, Rebecca. Mute me or do I need to do that? You can do that. Thank oh. you. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, well, that's no good. We definitely need to see you. I might start talking in the hope that I will pop up. Yeah, I think I think my colleague will... Um, start my video. Switch there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm um, sorry, I've got a lot of makeup on. I had to do a photo shoot this morning. Um, you don't need to apologise. So you need to ask me a question, don't you? <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, I'm just going to do a bit of a preamble um, and I really look forward to hearing, hearing from you. So climate change is arguably the biggest global human threat um, of the 21st century. 
uh, with climate related risks to health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security and economic growth. Projected to have serious impacts on all human systems and ecosystems if we continue on a business as usual basis. Despite widespread acknowledgement that climate change is a profoundly serious global problem, this awareness has not yet led to urgent action around the world that we have seen during a very, during a very short time in the COVID-19 pandemic. So my question to you, Rebecca, is your work has taken you into countless scientific studies on public opinion and behaviour around climate change. So what opinions, behaviour, social trends have you observed during COVID-19 that we could use to reframe solutions and language to take action on climate change, such as making better connections to human health to act on climate change? Yeah, so look, before I um, address this, the question in particular, I want to just make it clear the, the perhaps a slightly new response that I take to, um, to these kinds of questions around behaviour change, around climate change. And some of that's been informed by perhaps the um, federal election loss of last year, where it was clear that everybody thought climate change was very important and all the polling showed it was and everybody wanted urgent action, but that didn't necessarily translate um, politically to people's political behaviour. Um, and then also informed by a lot of the research I did around the fires, the extreme fires we had over uh, Christmas. Well, it wasn't just over Christmas, it was over months. And I think a lot of people like you and I and everybody on this, um, pretty much everybody in this webinar, when we see events like that, we imagine that that's a really profound and important turning point and people, you know, the penny must drop for people. Um, there's no evidence that that was the case at all. Um, all the research I've seen, all the research I've conducted has shown that actually it really wasn't. It did make the people who were already concerned far more concerned. It might have made people who were heading in that direction, um, really headed in that direction, head there quite quickly. But I was, I am still consistently shocked about the extent to which people um, didn't see that event as a climate event. And so I approach any big event now, no matter how significant, no matter how many experts stand up and say this is important, and I and talk about, you know, this is going to be a change, a significant change in our society. I, I naturally approach it with some caution and some scepticism, constantly questioning my own um, uh, confirmation bias because I would love nothing more than the fires over the summer to be a real wake-up call for the community and our politicians to take climate change more seriously, but it wasn't. I would really love us to emerge out of COVID-19 um, where there has been so much destruction, even in Australia, to, to small businesses, to communities, to people's lives. Um, we won't even think globally, we think in Australia that there has to be a silver lining. But in the end, what I need to do is look at all the research and also know that we probably can't judge that now because we're still emerging out of it. So I suppose the first thing I'd say is that um, I, over the um, span of COVID-19, I've probably been sent or given maybe 10 different um, quantitative pieces of research on what people think the pandemic means, particularly for climate change and what it might be, mean ongoing for behaviour change. And I personally have just finished some qualitative research looking at the extent to which Australians are interested in whether we can um, combine climate action with economic recovery. Um, that research is really just for, in fact, I just stopped writing the report in order to do this and have to deliver it to the client. So what I'm going to say really is a combination of um, my reflections on all the research that I have seen, all the research I've been involved in. I was involved in the ABC's really big, uh, you know, uh, COVID monitor, which has had wave after wave. And in some senses, the, the takeout from this research has been quite mixed because people are up and down. I don't know if, if, if you think about, particularly during the height of the pandemic, when it was really, really scary, we started to see everything shut down. I could feel, you know, anxious at 5am, okay at 11am, <laughs> um, you know, more anxious again at 3pm, kind of, and then, you know, after a few cocktails, maybe less anxious. So I was always really interested to see the extent to which, you know, when people are actually doing a survey, their, their mental health about what, how they kind of feel um, at the time. 
So I think one of the things that was really clear is that once, so the positives from all the research is that people have a sense of confidence that if the government um, is providing an effective framework, working together, perhaps pushing partisan politics to the side and listening to experts, it creates a wonderful opportunity for people to come together and for there to be consensus. And while there was lots of media reports about, you know, people squabbling for toilet paper and that concerned people, they thought that behaviour was really problematic, there were as many stories about you know, neighbourhoods coming together, making sure people were looked after, all those kinds of things. That's a very, you know, because Australians aren't as suspicious of government and law and regulation as perhaps other countries we, want, we won't name. And also because, let's face it, the pandemic, we didn't have hundreds and thousands of people dying. We didn't have, you know, um, vans of, 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 of body bags kind of, you know, um, driving through the streets. It was significant, but it wasn't terrifying in terms of the actual, um, the health impacts, like it was in places like Italy and in parts of America. We could feel a sense of camaraderie and, uh, and perhaps a bit more, um, a bit more uh, positive feeling from coming together than negative feeling about kind of shutting down. Um, none of the research necessarily showed that people felt um, a greater sense of belonging during the pandemic. Um, one thing that was clear is that people who already had strong social networks strengthened those social networks, but people that didn't have those social networks um, were not better off. They, and, and that shows that we always need to strengthen our social networks as a kind of preventative measure. You know, people don't, if people don't have friends, people to rely on, money to fall back on, a pandemic is not always a great, or any crisis is not always a great time to build them. Those networks have to already be pre-built and can be reinforced during a crisis, but it's so hard to build social, political, economic capital in a crisis. So that's absolutely true. And just before we finish, because I think there's going to be lots of questions and I want to keep you know, as close to five minutes as possible. My biggest concern going into the pandemic in relation to action on climate change was not so much that, you know, people would stop caring about climate change and only worry about economic recovery, because actually in the research I've done, there's no evidence that that's really the case. People recognise that there's a lot, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. So that's a good thing. The biggest thing I worried about is this idea, and we saw it, you know, millions of pictures and stories about, you know, often ridiculous stories that dolphins have come back to the, you know, um, Venice and things like that. But people did see actually real stories about environmental rejuvenation, that sense that, you know, pollution, emissions and all the rest and everything was going down with the fact that there was a shutdown. I was very cautious about those stories um, circulating because I was really worried that it was going to reinforce to people that um, environmental repair and, and action on climate change was associated with deprivation, was associated with isolation, was associated with economic turmoil, and in some cases also political turmoil. So I was really worried about the connections in people's heads around that. But, but actually, I don't think that that has happened. I'm actually quite confident that people believe that there are certain kinds of behaviours, and whether that's riding bikes, commuting less, um, making sure that we have, we build those green spaces, you know, for us to spend time with. Um, if, if there is actually a sense that we can transition back to a functioning economy while keeping some of those things that kept us emotionally and socially healthy that also have an environmental impact. So again, I need to wait. I need to kind of, you know, I need to wait to see whether that's something that holds. But that was my greatest fear. And one of the things I said to all my clients in the environment movement, be careful that you, if you keep showing images of environmental rejuvenation during a pandemic, because the people who aren't convinced who we really need to be talking to about environmental repair and climate change will say, oh, well, we all have to lose our jobs to make sure that the turtles come back to the beach and our emissions go down. And that's not what they want. And that feeds a really dangerous and problematic right-wing narrative, which is that, all environmentalists wants us all to be, you know, huddling in cages and huddling in caves and eating vegan for the rest of our lives, and that, that you know, taking away our utes and our hamburgers and all the rest of it. So, um, so I'm actually kind of cautiously optimistic about um, how we might emerge and the 
the um, openness that the broader community have that we can continue to act on, on the environment and climate change while rebuilding the economy. The key, key issue is leadership, great leadership in our politics, in our um, corporate life, in our community life that says that that is not only possible, but that um, that is probable. Thank you, Rebecca. There's certainly a lot of great stories around the world. Um, thinking about Amsterdam, for example, they're rebuilding, uh, they were already rebuilding through COVID using the donut um, principle of economics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Kate Raworth. Um, and, um, and cities around the world who have, who have adapted to um, bike only lanes. So basically they've, exactly. they've decommissioned um, car and, and truck lanes. And we know with, you know, just, just commenting further on the, the reduction of um, global emissions during COVID-19, um, 43% um, or thereabouts of reduction in, in emissions have come from cars and, and trucks being off the road. So, you know, in terms of building back better and shovel ready and all the yeah. uh, uh, transitioning and, and, you know, we're not hearing that the transitioning, um, a fair, tra fair transition, we're not hearing the um, the new Green Deal, we're not hearing enough of that in terms of our, um, our mainstream politics. So, you know, what are the stories yeah. that can we tell which will both capitalise on the fact that we've, we've seen, and um, Susie touched on this, a caring connectedness and a readiness for people to, to make some change, but how to actually counter the, the dominant narrative, which is what you're talking about as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Susie wants to um, uh, address that first. I mean, Sorry, are you able? Sorry, the question is, how do we talk to people about about going about economic recovery with climate as part of it? Or, well, I guess it's a, it's a mashup. It's such an interesting um, set of topics within the topic that we've covered already. Um, so, Susie, you talked before about um, the care and connectedness that we've seen in right. communities. Uh, Rebecca, you're touching on the fact that people. Um, that hasn't necessarily translated at this point in terms of care for planet. It certainly didn't translate in terms of the election last year. It didn't translate in terms of the research that's been done um, around the bushfires. So the question I have is how can we, through language, through the research, through, yeah. through the narrative, how can we make the, the better links between care for human health um, and yep. others and, and planetary health. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I think that people do get that connection. They probably get it more in a connection in terms of care of the environment than action on climate change. And I think that's important. We often in the movement collapse the two, but it's quite clear in the communities that we have to convince. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily, I've got no interest in my career in making people already really worried about the climate, more worried. In fact, um, none, <laughs> none. I have no interest in doing research on people like that. I'm interested in doing research on people who kind of think climate change is real, caused by us, but have a deep, deep cynicism about the ability of the, of, of leaders to do anything about it, wonder if there's a real connection between jobs and action on climate, question whether renewable energy can support our needs, um, question whether there's a link between climate change and, and bushfires and extreme weather events, and think that while it's all a big problem, it's gonna be a problem for their grandchildren, not their children and their, those are the only people I'm interested in talking to. And, it can, and the reality is sometimes we have to make a decision that making the links that we want to make are not possible with, to make, are not, are not the, 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 the kind of effort we have to make to forge those kinds of cognitive links actually puts, actually puts those people off. So we have to think about what is the most effective pathway and what is the, what is the end result? Like what is it we actually want people to do? We want people to vote for governments that take renewable energy seriously, right? That is basically like really, really seriously. Um, and that's what we want. Whether they do, whether they believe that, um, whether how, the steps that they have to take to get there, I'm quite agnostic about. <laughs> so I'm, I'm beginning to think that um, we have to have a whole new strategy before the next fire season. We have to rethink. We were kind of out. We were out flanked by, you know, it's a very difficult thing to, to come up against the might of, of 
News Corp and all the rest of it in terms of how they manipulate the media and what the, what kind of message they want to send out. But I'm, I think that we have to really kind of think about increasingly, just because of the time limit we have, the path of least resistance for different groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to COVID-19 and climate, I do think we have a real opportunity to say to people that an economic and techn technological transition, which is already underway around the world, and we could be further along the road with, is going to help us not only rebuild the economy, but get us ready for any other crisis that might come along, whether that be health, economic or otherwise. People get the link between protecting our environment, so clean soil, clean air, clean water, and health, not only just physical health, but emotional health. We've made that connection. But when you try and make that, when you try and move that discussion over to a discussion about climate change, which has been highly politicised for three decades, it's much, much harder. So I think that um, one of the things we have to think about is the kinds of arguments that help us with environmental protection are not always the ones that are going to help once we start talking about climate change. So those things often have to be decoupled for some groups of people. Um, and, you know, I think that the thing that the hardest thing and the biggest thing and the largest challenge is to make people believe that this transition is technically, economically, structurally possible in a way that will actually create the kinds of jobs um, that are secure, um, intergenerational and can sustain communities, whether those communities are outer metropolitan communities or regional communities. There is still so, so much work to be done on that. There is still so much resistance and so much lack of understanding about the possibility there. And that for me is the main game. Thank you, Rebecca. Now I'm going to take some questions from the audience now. And I think, uh, Susie, this one might um, be best place to you. So this is a question from Anna Spataru. So I'll get, um, I'll get Anna on the other uh, microphone to um, speak to this. Hello. Hello, Anna, welcome. So I've got your question here. Um, so would you like to ask your question to the panellists? Sure, yes. Uh, Actually, I typed another question in the meantime, um, and in some way they are related um, because first I was curious to know, um, because I was involved with a bit of climate activism, I wanted to know if there is any sort of um, result coming from all that, because I was also very disappointed to participate in a, uh, ACF's calling and to learn that those people don't really see that burning fossil fuel means climate change. And I was in a bit of a shock. Um, so that's the first question, if climate activism is having an impact on, because we know that governmental leadership is not really there, but are there any market-based incentives for climate action? In the US, I recently listened to a podcast and in the US they, there is quite, there's like platforms designed on like the way Facebook works, market, uh, marketplace Facebook works, where they're trading carbon emissions, but without strong government leadership, they can't really do much because, well, the laws are not very clear. So government leadership still matters in, in this greater picture. We can't just ignore it, I suppose. So I just wanted to hear a bit of your thoughts on that. Thank you, Anna. So we've got two Thank questions. You. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Anna, Anna, for the question. Well, I'm going to talk to the first question first, which was about does activism work? Is it any point to it? Um, and uh, like I call myself a climate activist. And, you know, when I was uh, looking at the research several years ago and I was writing the Climate Change Empowerment Handbook and I was working in my local community and I was thinking, OK, well, what's the most strategic thing that I could do that would give best bang for the buck? You know, if we've only got so much time to, you know, dedicate to this and to that and to that. What, what are the things that we can do that have got the greatest carbon reduction potential? And for me at the time, teaching people to get arrested in nonviolent direct action was the thing that I decided was the most effective way of re long term reducing carbon emissions, much more so than anything else that I could think of. So together with it, well, I, I, well, I didn't come up on this on my own, but I came up on this with a number of sort of trusted um, 
half friends in, and um, workers in my community. So we developed, we started up a group then in our local town to do that. So, you know, I'm a big fan of direct action for a number of reasons, and that's one form of activism. Um, because from a mental health perspective, so unlike Rebecca, I'm very interested in people that are already caring about climate change and are getting more and more worried because actually I see a lot of them in my, you know, private work. Um, plus there, I'm, I'm not saying that other people shouldn't be, but yeah. I'm saying for me as a researcher for yeah. organisations trying to shift the political dial, yeah, that's what. Oh, I'm sure. and Rebecca, I have said I love hearing you say that because I was listening to you and I was thinking, oh, I hate talking, I hate having those sorts of conversations. So I'm so grateful that you are the one yes. that with them. Um, uh, yes, so um, so from a mental health point of view, what one of the things that we know is incredibly important is for people to have a sense of efficacy and a group efficacy is a very powerful form of efficacy so group efficacy is the belief that together with a group you know we can make more of a difference than we can just just on our own and you know that's a really important message around climate change because there's a lot of debate and talk in the um you know amongst people about whether individual actions are really if whether there's any really any point to an individual action and of course yes there is but not if not because of their carbon emitting reduction potential there are other things about it strengthening your identity as somebody who cares about the environment and it gives you something to do but there are risks of being tokenistic about it and then forgetting to do the bigger action things um, and so on and so forth but group actions are incredibly important because it gives you a sense of a community it gives you a sense of hopefulness and to be able to have a sense of hope even um, even the form of active hope that I often talk about which is grounded in the reality of the fact that you know we are heading definitely to shoot over 1.5 degrees and probably over two degrees warming and things are going to get very very hot and very very nasty you know is um and, and that is a reality nonetheless it's the it's the feeling of hope and um collaboration and the sense that together we can do something we can make something that keeps us all going and engaged and getting up and doing more and more so you know for those reasons it's really important that i'm not even talking then about you know what um, what emissions you might be reducing in the meantime. However, I did also want to say that the research that is done by um, the by climate outreach says very clearly that protest images are not an effective way of campaigning on environmental issues because it only speaks to the people in the green bubble and it doesn't speak to the majority of other people who tend to see environmentalists as wealthy and moralistic and they switch off and, and don't listen. So there, and particularly at, at these times um, of COVID, climate protests are not going to be necessarily received by the public who you might be wanting to influence in a favourable way. Because in times of global threat like a pandemic, people's trust in the government is quite high. And so a protest tends to be perceived even more negatively than it might have it at another time. And so this is really clear in the research that's coming out of the out of um, climate outreach and on that um, and, I, and going back to something that Rebecca was talking about before about how do we help people to um, see that action on climate change um, means jobs and economic prosperity for our country one of the other things that comes out of their research and so climate outreach also has this sex segment of their um, of their work called climate visuals and they've worked very hard over many years um, doing research on what images of the environment are actually effective images in um, in in you know, in, in shifting people to believe that taking action on climate change is an important thing to do. That's a sort of a lame way of saying it. But um, And we tend to have always had this very narrow uh, pool of um, climate change images. So if you Google climate change image, you'll tend to get a poor polar bear, you know, on a ice flow, which is a useless image really for people down here in the south because it gives us the belief that climate change is far away from us and somebody else's problem doesn't really and it has to be something that we see as being um, salient and relevant to us for us to be engaged in doing something about it and so they work very hard to try to expand the pool of images that we know based on um, you know in-depth research actually are effective and one of the really important images that they talk about is images of real people doing real things and engaging with um, and real jobs engaging with renewable technology so people you know 
dusting the, I mean, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's people dusting the snow off their solar panels. You know, for us, it's, I don't know, taking the leaf litter off the solar panels or something like that, whatever, I'm just making things up. But yeah, so the, using images that are of real people engaging in a, uh, in a prosperous jobby way with renewable technology is one way in which we start to shift that, mm -hmm. um, shift people's minds to seeing that renewable energy is a way that people can have jobs mm -hmm. in Australia. People like us. Australians. I would just very, very briefly say that anyone that's ever um, studied complex social movements that have managed to do things over time have always said that protests, even quiet, um, what would you sort of protest by the fringe have been extremely important. They're just not the only solution, right? Yes. So you have to have a multiple prong. Now, I can say that the thing that that switched me from somebody who was generally concerned about climate change to just wanting to research, think and write a book about it was the kids strikers. Um, and that was, an, that was a extreme moment where I thought, these kids are my kids' age and they're asking us to do something as an adult generation that have helped create this problem and perhaps have a bigger platform than they did. So it was extremely important. Um, there is no, it, it, saying that, that the protests are the only way to bring about change is as naive as saying, oh, only conservative politicians will bring about change or only the renewable energy sector will bring about change. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we have such an urgent issue with so many challenges. Um, everybody has, we, we need to throw every single thing at it, including the kitchen sink. And part of that, Rebecca, too, because I, uh, I completely agree with you, part of that for each individual out there is to find something that, that they're passionate exactly. about and that they're good at and to use your talents in your own area. It'll be completely different for all of us. Exactly. And we may gravitate to a different messenger around that. So I do think we do need that there would be some people of a conservative mindset concerned about climate for whom the children's strikers are not going to be an inspiration, but, but somebody else is. Right, not Tony Abbott, but somebody, but, but maybe a maybe a conservative on somebody on the conservative side of politics, or somebody who's a fourth generation wheat farmer, and and that's going to be the person that they're going to listen to. So, um, so that's that's my answer really on the on the uh, protest question. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Rebecca. So this leads well into a question from the audience, and um, also Rebecca, we've got a, li a link to your book. Yeah, that's out in that, which is great. So I'm um, happy to talk about climate change in a way that makes a difference. So the question yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw to Steve Petit. Um, oh, welcome, hello. Steve. Um, we'd love to hear your question that you posted about um, a productive conversation. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, hi, Steve. Was... Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Susie. Uh, what's the best way to have a productive conversation with people who don't, I guess, believe in climate change? So, because I find it's it's very difficult because they tend to have their own sets of facts. So you try to have a yeah. factual conversation, but then they have what they think are facts, and you have what you yeah. believe are the real facts, and then it's just it goes nowhere. So that's yeah. Yeah, actually, well, look, if you want, there's an answer in this book for that. But I mean, Susie will have some questions too because I'm sure she's got people in her, you know, people that you talk to about how they talk to people in their world about the things that can. But I, I mean, and we could talk forever, and we haven't got a lot of time. So, but what I would say is that um, it. You need to start with a conversation, not about climate change, but what matters to that person. What informs their views about climate change? And what? And the other thing I do too, because basically most of my research is with people who aren't like us, um, I'm always interested about what about the climate change conversation upsets them the most? Like, what is it that that is the roadblock for them? Um, and it might be this idea that, you know, Australia, we should be doing something when overseas people can't. So what is it about this idea of the, of, of, you know, where Australia is globally? So I always try and listen as much as I start to talk. And this is, you're not going to change somebody who's resistant to climate change in a five or 10 minute conversation. It's an evolving question. Um, the one thing you really need to do first is kind of get a sense of whether they are actually a hardcore denier who is almost, who is going to no matter what stick to their guns because it isn't about facts, it's about something else, right? Or if there's somebody who's just anxious, concerned, confused. And there are a couple of questions you can um, 
ask that where you work that out to kind of get a very very big very kind of firm sense of who they are what matters to them and where their resistance is about the question and whether they are actually a hardcore denier and most research shows that hardcore deniers in Australia are somewhere but I mean depends on the survey you look at that it's either in single figures or maybe up to 15 percent people who just determined not to believe it's real everybody else sits on a, a spectrum of persuadability about something so you've got to work out where they sit and what they care about before you start to talk to them about co2 levels or you know the latest um csiro report but anyway susie will have some tips as well oh thank you i guess i was going to say also start off by listening <laughs> <laughs> That's always a really good starting place. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about the numbers of the, what the research does share about the numbers of people who do truly de uh, truly denialists. So one of my colleagues, Joseph Reeser, um, has been involved in some sort of really widespread demographically qualitative studies of people's attitudes of climate change and was doing that in collaboration or in association with um, ones that were done in the UK and ones that were done in America. And, and the ones in America get repeated year after year after year. I'm forgetting the name of the lead, um, one of the lead researchers, but I think it's through the Yale, I think it's through Yale. And yeah, the, the Yale program, yeah. So yeah. is it the Six Americas? Yeah, yes. oh, yeah, yeah. And so they are, they're taking they're taking the pulse of Americans, and Joe was taking the pulse of Australians. And what they reliably find in English speaking countries is that yes, the true denialists are sitting around six to nine percent of the population. I think it's really helpful for people to know that because that's a really small percentage. They're very powerful and yeah. loud, but it's a very small percentage. Yeah. And so it's and and but one of the other bits of interesting research is that the general public actually have a misperception of how many people truly deny the science on climate change and it's a much more inflated number which is actually really unhelpful for us to be incorrectly thinking that more people don't accept that human behavior is causing climate change so that's yeah. just something i wanted to yeah. and so so people should know that the six americas study i spent some time at yale last with last year with them and i write about it in the book and um uh, I'm involved, in fact, we're just in a discussion guide mode of doing the equivalent of that in Australia, um, which will be available to people and launched by August of this year. And that will be run every year for the next five years. So we'll have a really, really good understanding of um, complex attitudes to climate change, renew renewables, politics, um, um, and some really good understanding of what the emotional response to climate change is and the cognitive barriers. So I'm really excited. Maybe I'll come back and talk to people about that when that's um, ready to launch in August. Now, that'd be so great. I'm so pleased to hear about that. Um, <coughs> one of the questions that I noticed in the chat earlier was in response to something that you had said, Rebecca, about how do you properly ascertain somebody's attitude that's not just influenced by, you know, sort of what news story they heard on the radio that morning and these yes. um and these better qualitative studies are using ways of asking the questions and i mean all good social scientists know how to ask questions that actually takes the pulse rather than just the the weather right yeah exactly just a list of concerns and you know all the rest of it absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the really good research that um, Rebecca is talking about and in, involved in can actually take the underlying and enduring concern that doesn't change day by day depending on what's happening in the news. So yeah, it's something absolutely. that always gets controlled. Yeah. We've got one more question time for, from the audience. Um, I'm going to uh, switch over to Rebecca Sweeney. Now, Rebecca, you've asked several questions, but I'm interested in, in one question, if I can be so bold, as to get you to ask a question about youth TikTok political action in the USA. <laughs> uh, okay, so I just wanted an opinion from Susie about uh, the your thoughts on the psychology of that with youth participating in such a strong political way. And Rebecca, what your uh, insight is to the social trend that that has established? Right. I, say, I didn't hear what Jane was saying. So okay, sorry. It's the TikTok action that youth uh, uh, pulled on Donald Trump for his Tulsa meeting, where they had millions booked, and you know, a, a small a small number turned out. It was very funny. Yeah. Yes. So <clears throat> I think it's really dangerous. Um, you know, it is funny. 
But, um, you know, tr Trump's really got his back against the wall and um, he is dangerous when he's embarrassed and humiliated and, um, you right. know, whilst it, and it, and it really illustrates just how little respect there is for the rule of order and for the government. And that's not a safe place to be. And so, um, yeah, I feel really uneasy about it because it was a, an extraordinary story and it was amusing. And yet what's going to happen next? You know, this is a, it's, you know, when people are humiliated and failing left, right and centre, what do they do next? And it, I think there's a risk that, that, that this always leads to more authoritarian closing down of groups, people, things like that. I mean, one of, I mean look, we haven't got much time. We could talk about forever about, about how people at times of crisis can think that they turn to kind of big daddy authoritarian leaders but often those leaders can get them killed <laughs> because they are kind of, and, and so I think one of the things, you know, as much as perhaps people on this call might not like the current government, uh, federal government, um, they have largely taken a, an approach, um, you know, in combination with other states of, of actually quite significant regulation of actually saying that the government should do a whole range of things, that we should actually shut the government the shut the economy down because the health of vulnerable people is actually a really important thing that we need to think about. So I think that, you know, we can be complacent about not becoming like America and we should never do that. But I was very interested in the early stages of the pandemic, some of the right wing columnists that were trying to run the kinds of lines that the American press can run about, oh, well, it's, you know, it's the nanny state and people are overreacting. And if I want to cough on somebody, it's my democratic right to do so. That did not take hold in Australia particularly well. And all the research showed continuously that people supported the restrictions. They were worried about them being lifted too soon. They were prepared if they had some support, particularly from public and private organisations to continue this kind of behaviour. And actually where we, again, don't want to be complacent, but our approach to, to freedom, to law, to government and to community has served us well and saved lives. Well, just as a closing remark from, from both of you. Jane, you've gone very quiet again. Oh, how's that, Susie? Much better. Oh. Still, you're still quiet, but we've got a, we've almost finished. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure why. Uh, <laughs> we've demonstrated our global capacity to mobilise around a crisis, well, most, most governments have anyway. Um, so just as a, uh, as a takeaway and action from both of you, what can we do to, to take action on, um, to take action to bring more peace, prosperity, um, and, and a safe climate. So just as a, as a closing remark from both of you, what's an action that we can all do? Oh, well, I'm gonna go for, um, you know, ring up all of your local politicians and your federal politicians and, and, you know, say that you absolutely expect that the economic stimulus needs to involve green jobs and closing down a fossil fuel and no gas and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, I think that's important and I would I would back that up by trying to find ways to have those conversations with people in your workplace and people in your family. Um, again, you've got to be really, you know, you've got to be, you know, you pick your target and you pick your approach. But we need to break the climate silence in all parts of the community because once we do that, politicians can't say, oh, people say that they care about climate on a survey, but nobody actually really talks about it. Nobody cares. They don't actually care. So we need to make, we need to find a way to break the climate silence in every part of our lives so that that can be heard by political leaders. Well, I'm going to find a way to have you both back on a panel <laughs> in the coming months, because I think you're both going to be doing the most amazing research and, uh, and work in your practice this year and, and next year with everything we're talking about. So thank you so much for your time today. And we're putting your books and your research papers into the chat and um, I'm sure we'll have more questions coming through, so. Thanks everyone, see ya. Thank you so much. And this closes the final uh, series winter webinar for, for June, uh, but please stay tuned on our, our series Facebook page for future events. Thank you so much and have a great day.